All right. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Pat, and uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Jack Witness, as uh, Pat just said, I'm involved with our uh, FAVLAP AIS uh, and Water Quality Committee. We've had a number of these uh, presentations that you may have attended before. They have involved uh, usually several speakers and go on for a couple hours. We thought we'd try something a little different this time. That is to have something at the noon hour <clears throat> so that people can uh, enjoy their lunch as we're seeing uh, Tracy Shaddy's doing and a number of others <laughs> out there. Um, and so that hopefully others can uh, join us at the at the noontime hour. So this is the first one of these we've tried this way. And uh, I hope we get some uh, some feedback from you. So uh, it's my pleasure today to uh, welcome you to our overview of the LakeWise program. I know many of you are familiar with this. Um, and our speaker today, uh, Allison Marcioni, is uh, uh, recently uh, stepped into that position after Amy Peacott retired uh, a year or so ago. So we're really lucky to have this, uh, 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 have Allison as our speaker today. If you do have questions, um, I'll ask you to put them in the chat box and Martha Winston will be helping us uh, with uh, that later in the hour. I think there's no other really housekeeping things. It's a more simple uh, type of meeting than we've had in the in the past. So I'd like to introduce to you Allison uh, Marcioni. We're very lucky to have her. Um, Allison is the DEC Lakes and Ponds uh, Program uh, and Lakeshore Coordinator. I didn't realize this, but she's a Vermont native, having grown up in Brookfield, which is in central Vermont. She has her bachelor's in environmental science from Wells College on the shores of Lake uh, Cuyahoga in uh, central New York. And she obtained her master's in environmental science and land management from the Sacred Heart University in Fairfield, Connecticut, where she worked on coastal shoreline and habitat restoration. She spent the last seven years working at a land conservation nonprofit as a land steward and program director where she did anything and everything from running the community garden to organizing large fundraisers. We can sure use that and specializing in outreach and education. Allison lives uh, in Heartland, Vermont now, where she's an avid gardener, baker, book lover, and traveler. So Allison, welcome. And uh, we look forward to hearing uh, what you want to share with us today. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you all for having me here today. I'm really excited to be giving this presentation. Um, I'm just going to share my screen uh, and we can get going. So just give me a minute. All right. You need to enable me to share my screen, whoever the host is. So, oh, Pat, if you could do um, that, please. It should be. Should be okay. Uh, yep. All right. Here we go. And all right. Can everyone see what we got up there? Good. Yep. All right. Fantastic. So yeah, thank you for having me today. Um, as Jack said, my name is Allison Marcioni. I'm the Lake Shoreland Coordinator at the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation. And among other things, I run the LakeWise program, which I think probably many of you are at least somewhat familiar with. So today we're gonna do an overview of the program and how it works, um, go over some uh, of the most common best management practices that are recommended as a part of the program. Um, and then I also have a few questions that were sent to me ahead of time that I'm going to go through and answer. We're going to talk a little bit about Likewise Gold Award, and um, then I'm going to open it up to questions uh, that all of you may have. So let's get going. So um, when we're talking about the Likewise program, one of the important things to understand is the background of the program. And one of the, the big issues in Vermont when it comes to lakes are that Vermont's lakeshores have really high development pressure on them and high development density. 
So 13% um, of Vermonters live within 250 feet of a lakeshore. And compared with our more densely populated areas, um, that population density is, is more residences per square mile than someplace like Burlington, which is crazy to me. <laughs> um, and we also know that shoreline alteration is a really high indicator of biodiversity distress, and, it, and it's worse than eutrophication or acidification of lakes. Um, shoreline alteration is a huge problem for lake health. So when we're talking about um, shoreline development and in the LakeWise program, and what we would like to see instead of that, what we would rather see are living shorelines rather than overly developed shorelines. And living shorelines have a ton of benefits. Um, they produce wildlife habitat, they stabilize banks and protect property values, and they also um, protect and enhance water quality. So um, we know that living shorelines provide multiple benefits to everyone. However, um, as much as we value wildlife and clean water, um, humans also tend to remove vegetation uh, and along shorelines. And that is like the most important component of shoreline uh, is the vegetation and how it, it holds in the soil and protects water quality. So we've, we're at sort of odds um, with nature in this regard. These are some pictures of traditional shoreline development in Vermont. Um, the National Lake Assessment Study showed that Vermont ranks the worst in the nation for lakeshore disturbance because of extensive shoreline clearing that happened prior to 2014 in the Shoreline Protection Act. Um, a lot of Vermont's lakes were high, heavily developed prior to 2014, and a lot of that development looked just like this, um, with houses or buildings really close to the water, um, little or no vegetation, and some pretty poor stormwater practices. So um, this is where the LakeWise program comes in, right? We have all this development prior to 2014 um, with questionable practices, and the LakeWise program is here to assist landowners who, who have some of those properties. So uh, the LakeWise program, the goal of the program is to establish a culture of lakeshore living that is proven to protect the lake through stormwater management best practices. Uh, LakeWise is an initiative of the Agency of Natural Resources and it awards shoreline properties that have lake friendly practices. Um, properties that are eligible for participation in the program um, include state parks, town beaches, private homes and businesses. Basically, if it's on a lake, uh, it's probably eligible for a LakeWise assessment and award. Um, so the assessment program is a free stormwater management and erosion assessment that offers technical assistance and compare landowners with um, resources. And LakeWise aims to inform, teach, and encourage change in the current lakeshore development practices to the one, to ones that are more lake friendly. So all of this is voluntary. Um, the assessments are free, and it's really just a program to encourage people to take care of their homes and yards in a way uh, that is beneficial for the lake. Um, so how does this program work? It is based on social science. Um, we know through social science that people are not influenced most by their friends or their family or the news or politics. They're influenced by what their neighbors are doing. And so properties that have lake friendly practices on lakes are given the award as a model property. Um, and the award certifies that that property is well managed using shoreline best management practices and is maintained in a way that cares for the lake. Those awards are displayed. I'm sure you've all seen them um, somewhere on, on the lakes that you are on. Um, and that award is displayed to inspire other people um, to be interested in the program, uh, to get involved and to hopefully make changes to their properties so that they too can earn the award. And so in this way, cumulatively, we increase the health of the lake through each of our individual actions. Really quickly, because I get this question a lot from people is why are we talking so much about stormwater um, and sediment? Because there's water in the lake, there's dirt in the lake. Like what's the problem with more water and dirt in the lake? Um, for people who don't understand how the, the chemical processes are working, it, it can be a little um, counterintuitive that we would need to stop water from going into water. <laughs> Um, so the way that stormwater moves across the landscape influences how much sediment is carried to and deposited in the lake. Um, that sediment can cause problems for the water body because of increased phosphorus. Phosphorus is often bonded with sediments. So when you're moving sediments into the water, it's not just dirt, it's also um, phosphorus and other chemicals. And you might not think of this as 
pollution because it's not, you know, um, gasoline or vinyl chloride or, you know, something you really don't want in the water, but you actually really don't want too much phosphorus in the water. Phosphorus is the limiting nutrient in um, aquatic systems, and it's what all aquatic plant life uh, needs to grow. And so when you have more water moving over land, it picks up more sediments that are bonded with phosphorus and allow and, and when you allow that sediment to reach the water, you're adding a, a potentially dangerous input that can throw the lake system out of balance. So too much phosphorus in the water can lead to too much plant life, which includes algae. Um, and you can get large algal blooms, which I know nobody wants. <laughs> um, and that includes toxic blue-green algae. And that eventually can also cause eutrophic conditions, a lack of dissolved oxygen in the water, which can lead to all sorts of other problems. Um, so it's really in everyone's best interest to uh, limit the amount of phosphorus entering our lake systems by managing stormwater on their own properties. Back to the LakeWise program. Um, so the LakeWise program evaluates properties in four categories, uh, driveway, structures and septic, recreation areas, and shoreline. Participants are provided with technical assistance um, to make their properties as lake friendly as possible. So you get an assessment and then um, you get a report following that assessment that has recommendations for improvement. Um, all of this is free and voluntary. Like I said, there's no regulatory aspect of it. So I don't visit people's properties and tell them what they have to do. I make suggestions about what they might like to do. Um, and uh, it's all completely free. Um, and if a property does pass all four of the categories, they get the LakeWise Award, um, which is pictured here for anyone who hasn't seen it before. Um, so how do you go about doing all of this? The first step is to contact me um, via email and set up a time to have your property assessed. Um, the assessment usually takes about an hour and a half. It happens in person. Uh, we prefer to have the homeowner um, there for the assessment to answer questions. Um, then, you know, depending on what happens, if you earn the LakeWise Award, great, you might get an award day of. I like to carry them around in my car with me. Um, so there's no mailing of heavy metal signs. Um, or you, if you don't get an award, either way, you'll get a report with suggestions. Um, there'll be more suggestions if you didn't get an award of improvements that could be made. And then if you make changes, you can request a reassessment and um, obtain the LakeWise Award. All right, that was the brief overview of how the LakeWise program works. Um, if there's any questions about that, please put them in the chat. I'll answer them at the end. I want to talk, you know, one slide really briefly about the LakeWise Gold Award because I have received a lot of questions about this from different lake associations. And I think that there was a lot of confusion um, maybe around what the qualifications were to obtain the LakeWise Gold Award. And I think everyone probably has seen that uh, last summer, a third lake did uh, achieve the LakeWise Gold Award. So there are only three lakes that have done it, uh, Echo Lake in Charleston, um, Seymour Lake in Morgan, both in 2017 um achieved the lake wise gold award and this last summer in 2022 lake iroquois uh also hit that milestone really great i'm very happy with every all of that um in order to achieve the lake wise gold award 15 percent of all of the properties around the lake residential public businesses access areas um undeveloped land uh have been awarded the lake wise award that is the flat percentage number that is the only requirement um, if you think that your lake community meets this criteria, I suggest that you contact me with the number of LakeWise awards and the parcel data, and I will review this information, make sure that it matches DEC records. And if your lake has um, hit this milestone, then um, I'll be writing a press release for you. Uh, so there are two things that I want to say about how this is working currently. So two things to be clear with. One is that record keeping has been a struggle within this program. Um, and we are currently moving from a paper assessment system and a manual database to um, a digital system where record keeping and tracking will be much more, much easier and more rigorous. Um, at this current time, I know probably all of you have seen the Google map on the website. That map is updated through the 2021 field season. Um, it is not current and it is not going to be updated for 2022. Instead, it is going to be replaced in the coming months with something that is new and updated, but we're not updating that current one. So if you're looking at that, it does not include any assessments that were done in 2022. If you would like that information, please just email me and I will tell you how many assessments were done on your lake. 
I don't know what that is. Um, all right. And the second thing to know about this is that um, the award is currently given out on what I want to call an application basis, um, which is that I currently have no way of tracking what's going on at all of the 400 lakes in Vermont. Um, so it's not an automatic system. So it's not like I have a, a ticker somewhere that's counting down the number of Lakewise awards each uh, lake needs in order to reach the gold status. So it really requires a champion at each lake or lake association to contact me and say, hey, I think we're close and then work with me um, to see how many more awards you need or see if you've already passed the bar. Um, in the case of Lake Iroquois, Shannon Kelly got in touch with me early in the 2022 field season and said, we wanna go for it this year. Tell me how many more awards we need. Um, and then he worked very hard to set up assessments and reassessments and get, the, get over the number for 15% for Lake Iroquois. So at the current time, that is really what it uh, requires. Um, and I will just say one of the easiest ways to look at parcel data is through the VCGI parcel viewer. It's online um, and it's, it's pretty easy and up to date. And I will take any questions we have about Lake Wise Gold also at the end. Um, that's all I'm gonna say about it right now. So I'm gonna go through some best management practices really quickly, just so everyone knows what kinds of things we're looking at and what kinds of things that are being suggested through the Lake Wise program. Um, because I think sometimes people are a little bit afraid of what might get suggested to them or um, you know, think that it's a really big project. Uh, so we're gonna talk really quickly about each of the four assessment areas, starting with roads and driveways. As you can see here, this is a, a driveway with some significant erosion issues. There are these deep rivulets coming down the driveway. Um, and this is a problem that we see often on driveways and on private roads, um, especially driveways though, as it tends, landscape tends to slope down towards the lake. Um, so one of the things we very commonly suggest for driveway issues are open top culverts. So this is a before and after um, photo uh, after being on the right. And you can see the open top culvert here. The, the thing about water uh, and erosion is that the issue isn't the amount of water, it is the velocity that the water is traveling at. So the idea is always to stop and or slow the water down so that it can't have such an erosive force. So in this case, the water is caught by the culvert and diverted off to the side. That can either be to a vegetated area or in this case, um, to this stone area, the stones work to further slow the velocity of the water and also catch and filter out sediments. We are always suggesting vegetated edges around parking areas and driveways so that any water that's flowing off of those um, impervious surfaces can be caught by vegetation. Same here, this is just a vegetation in a swale. Um, if the topography of your property uh, is conducive to this, that is a really great way to uh, catch stormwater and filter it into the ground. This is a rain garden on the side of a road. So in this case, the water was coming off of this road onto the property and then right off to the uh, left there is the house. And so they were trying to divert water away from their house and ended up with a rain garden that will soak in the water um, and filter it out and slow it down. Uh, rock line ditches, I'm sure anyone who's driven around Vermont has seen these all over the place on the sides of dirt roads. Again, it's just to slow and filter um, the water. Next, septic and structures. I do want to make a note here because I've had a couple of people ask me about this. Um, you do not have to have a septic system in order to have a lakewise assessment. Some people who have like an outhouse or um, moldering privy or other form of a bathroom area <laughs> um, are not disqualified from getting a lakewise award. You can you can still do it. The septic questions just don't apply to you. Um, similarly, if you have a, a lakeside property that doesn't have structures. Um, and is we would consider that an undeveloped parcel and you are also still eligible for a lakewise assessment. There's a, a completely separate assessment for an undeveloped parcel. Um, so don't hesitate to reach out to the program if you have any of those situations and are interested in an assessment. Um, so what we're really looking at when, when it comes to structures and septics, we're looking at um, where does the rain go once it hits your roof? Um, what percentage of your property is impervious and impervious is like, you know, the roof, a deck, um, a patio, a driveway, a parking area, those are all considered impervious surfaces. Um, and then there's the questions about septic, which cover the age, location, and maintenance of your septic system. Um, 
this this section is probably the one that has the most questions for landowners and is why we like landowners to be present um, for their assessments. So um, this is just an example of how a rain garden can be used to divert water from either downspouts um, or other sort of uh, water flow. Um, rain gardens, like I talked about in the driveway section, uh, you know, catch and infiltrate water down into the ground and do a really great job of that. And uh, yeah, they're also, they can be very um, attractive and pretty additions to your yard. Um, we're often suggesting dry wells in the case of downspouts um, or infiltration trenches for, for either gutter downspouts or for um, just like a roof line drip. Again, this just catches the water, filters it, slows it down, sends it into the ground rather than over the grass. Um, rain barrels, always a great addition. I would just say, you know, make sure you have something to do with all that water. <laughs> Um, these work really well for some people and not for others, uh, but there's like plenty of options for what to do with sort of your downspout water. Um, but if you've got a garden, this is a great uh, addition, a great way to catch rainwater and, and repurpose it. Uh, the recreation area is generally, it's separate from the shoreline area. And in some properties, this makes a lot of sense and in some it doesn't, and it really depends on the size of the property, but the recreation area is generally considered the lawn area and not like the shoreline area, the dock access, none of that. That's all covered in shoreline. On some properties, the properties are so small that it's hard to differentiate, but um, we are talking about more of the lawn here. Um, so this is another um, example of a rain garden and how it can be used not to catch downspout water in this case, but to catch water coming down that hillside towards the lake. Um, and so this is a, a perennial rain garden that is well mulched. Mulch is really important to have in all of your perennial gardens um, when you live on a lake shore to uh, collect and absorb moisture and rainwater, which is not always what landscapers suggest um, because sometimes Mulch in other places um, can be considered a little bit of a strangling, uh, have a strangling effect on perennial gardens, but you have to know how to apply it and know that uh, in a rain garden situation, you do want it to be well mulched. Um, again, rain gardens are really, can be really beautiful perennial additions to your yard. Um, and I will say we are always at the Lakewise program suggesting that folks use native plants um, when they are putting in plantings, either rain gardens or shoreland plantings. Um, but I also what would like to stress that some plants are better than no plants. And so if you are very particular about how your yard looks, if you really like a particular kind of perennial that is not native, you know, it's better than nothing. Um, and as long as it's not invasive, that is the, the cutoff for me. Don't plant invasive plants, please. Um, Another example of a rain garden that is well mulched and uh, taking uh, up some of what was this sort of eroded, dry looking um, dirt patch. All right, no mow. I'm always telling people the easiest thing to do is nothing. I hate mowing my lawn so much. <laughs> um, and so I have let patches of it just go back rewild. I, I don't want to mow it. Um, and if you have a, a large area, if you have a large yard, you might consider um, softening the edges and letting them rewild. Uh, you might consider that there are sections that you don't really use that could be um, converted into no mow and rewilded. It doesn't have to um, subtract from your ability to reach the lake. As you can see, there's um, a very wide path here uh, going down to the lake on that bottom photo. And uh, it is a very easy, effective, cheap way of adding wildlife habitat and adding um, vegetated areas that prevent erosion and um, keep the lake clean and healthy. We're also always um, asking for people to delineate their pathways. So in that top photo, you can see um, that was a path that was being walked, you know, all over and kind of trampled. There's no vegetation. Um, it's all kind of bare dirt. So anytime it rained, this dirt would get, you know, washed downhill. And by delineating pathways, like in the photo on the bottom, you can see that some of those areas got replanted um, with native plants and mulched and the pathways and steps are now delineated so that people will only walk on them. And um, I think it, it looks a lot nicer personally. 
So we're always asking for folks to try and uh, delineate pathways, especially down towards the water. And to do that in sort of a meandering way, you can see how that um, main path there kind of meanders. So there's no straight shot down to the lake for, um, for water to just barrel down. Uh, infiltration steps, another often recommended um, best management practice. This is for steeper areas. Uh, steps are generally safer and also able to meander. And these infiltration steps are built a lot like the infiltration trenches or the dry wells where they're dug out and filled with crushed stone so the water will seep down um, into them. We also always suggest uh, that we that infiltration steps are paired with um, some landscaping around the edges. Not only does this add extra vegetation and mulch to absorb water and look nice, um, but it also keeps people on the path. I will say this works really well on private property. Um, on public property, all bets are off where people are going to walk. Um, but landscaping does tend to deter people from trampling over it. Um, so in this case, you can clearly see that you're supposed to walk on these stairs and um, keep the trampling erosive effects of walking over bare ground uh, away. Uh, this is just another example of steps on a steeper slope um, and how that can be a really nice and attractive addition to your property. Now the shoreline section. So in the LakeWise program, we are very heavily focused on a vegetated shoreline. It is probably the most important part of the assessment um, and the most important thing, you know, if you're only going to change one area, I would suggest enhancing your shoreline to be the most beneficial um, thing you can do. So um, having a vegetated stable shoreline reduces erosion and runoff and also helps, you know, stabilize against wave action and ice push. Um, and what we're really looking for in our assessments is how much vegetation there is along the shore, um, how wide that buffer is, um, and what kinds of plants there are, because you want a variety of different kinds of plants um, holding in your shoreline. So um, this is a picture of a native planting that was recommended and done. Um, again, we're always going to recommend natives, um, but it's, it would, it's not the end of the world if you plant non-natives as long as they're not invasive, um, because they will still work to hold in your shoreline, and that's what's really important here. Um, this is an example where this retaining wall was failing. Um, you can see there's a lot of um, erosion happening behind the wall and the wall is sort of falling over. And in this case, it was replaced by this perennial um, garden. It was probably, you know, a little bit of a regrade, added some dirt uh, and created what I think is a much nicer looking um, garden area that's protecting this sandy beach from being washed right into the water. So um, another example of how plants are really um, one of the best ways to retain soils and hold them in. Um, and again, this is a, a property where the, um, the shoreline area is just being left to grow back and sort of rewild itself um, and still, still an attractive place. So they still have a beautiful view um, and they're just letting things grow. Uh, this is another uh, Nomo area with some really beautiful wildflowers within it. And this is a, a good example of, I think, living sort of within nature as opposed to at odds with it. Um, the shoreline is heavily vegetated. It's got one very small access area down to the dock. The chairs are down on the dock and not up in the yard so that, you know, there's no concerns about uh, views or anything like that. From the house and the deck, there is still views through the trees. Um, and I think it's a very like lovely, serene, natural looking um, backyard. Uh, there are projects where, you know, just planting some bushes or not mowing your lawn or is not going to cut it. Um, and those projects uh, require more of a bioengineering take. So as you can see on these three photos at the bottom, um, this bank was being severely undercut by uh, wave action from the lake, and it was right on the edge of a road, so it was posing a public safety issue as well. Um, so a bioengineering project was done here. Uh, they installed, installed these coir logs, sort of building out the bank again. These are filled with soil, and then they're um, closed, and plants are planted 
in inside of them. Like you can see uh, in this middle picture, these sort of branches sticking out. Um, this is mid installation. So this isn't what it looked like when it was finished. Um, and then a few years later, that bank is reestablished, it's revegetated, um, and it's safe for the public, it's protecting the lake health. Um, so these bigger projects do happen, um, a bunch of them happen this summer, more scheduled for next summer. Um, and they are big projects, they can be expensive, but there are funding sources uh, to help with these sorts of projects. So um, they do happen. This is just a little um, diagram to show where we've been, where I hope we are now, and where I hope we're going in the future with our ability to kind of live um, within nature uh, and enhance uh, our own properties with vegetation and living sort of in harmony <laughs> with the lake. Um, these are some very happy participants in the LakeWise program. And uh, I, I hope, you know, there'll be more of them next summer. And now um, we're getting to the portion of the presentation where I received some questions ahead of time that I wanted to just answer right off, right in the front. Um, and then if there are additional questions or questions about these questions, we can um, get to those next. So what can lake associations do to help the DEC LakeWise program? And what can FabLab do to help the DEC LakeWise program? This is a great question. <laughs> Thanks for offering the help. Um, so the best thing that lake associations and FabLab um, can do is things exactly like this, right? Um, it's really about getting the word out, doing outreach. Um, it's, you know, I, I just had a little article in the latest FabLab newsletter doing this workshop is great. Um, I've spoken at different lake association meetings to kind of get the word out. Um, and that is really helpful. In addition to that, um, many lakes that we worked on last summer had a person at their lake association who was sort of the LakeWise champion um, who, you know, got the word out, um, talked with their neighbors, went so far as to help us schedule days out on the lake. Um, and in some cases, I was even, you know, driven around from property to property. It made it extremely easy for me um, to visit those lakes and do those assessments. And it's always easier, you know, to schedule five or six assessments in a day and just do them all rather than make five or six trips out to whatever um, lake, especially because most of the lakes in Vermont are fairly far north. So um, those are the best ways. It's really all about outreach and education and getting people interested and involved. You know, give them my name, give them my email. I'm always happy to talk to people. Um, what are your personal long-term plans, goals, and objectives for the LakeWise program? Uh, so in general, my plan is to expand this program into areas that it hasn't reached um, before. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. This summer, there's going to be a more of an emphasis on Lake Champlain uh, because there are a lot of issues happening on the lake and it has so far been um, less easy to work <clears throat> directly on Lake Champlain than some of the inland lakes. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I'm also looking at each tactical basin within the state and um, seeing which lakes have been called out in tactical basin plans based on their Vermont Lake scorecard, um, scores for water quality and shoreline, and targeting those lakes um, for more outreach and education. A lot of them have never had a lake-wise assessment done. So I'm, I'm trying to expand the program into some areas where it has not yet uh, been working. I'm also expanding the number of trained uh, lake-wise assessors at other organizations. Um, and as I said previously, sort of modernizing the assessments by moving to an app instead of using all paper and having a, a database that talks with the app instead of having to do all manual inputs of data into the database. That's going to save a lot of time, which means that there'll be more time for on the ground assessments um, and, and work like that rather than spreadsheets. Um, so I think that those are, the, those are the main things that I'm working on sort of expanding in the coming year. And I you know, hope it's all very successful. Um, this next question kind of ties into that. How do you plan on maximizing the number of lake-wise evaluations your program can do during the summer? Will we have summer assistance? Um, I've already sort of answered, what do you think local lake association volunteers can do? And will we be establishing a program with a designated individual at each lake? Um, so 
the answer to this question is <clears throat> last summer, the uh, program as a whole performed 150 Lakewise assessments, which is a huge number. Um, I think there's maybe only one year in the beginning that did any more than that. Um, that might even be a lie, that might be the most. Um, and that included all of the Lakewise ass assessments that were done, including by other organizations and by DEC. Um, <clears throat> and those other organizations are <clears throat> NRCDs, um, Lakewise assessments done as part of Lake Watership Action Plans, and any other um, group that is performing them. Of those 150, about 90 were done by myself and the seasonal assistant, Matt. I think a lot of you probably met Matt. Um, and he was employed with DEC from June to December. So in 2023, I will actually have two Lakewise assistants. Um, They're both being funded through the Lake Champlain Basin Program. So one of those assistants is um, going to be covering generally the inland lakes um, within the Champlain Basin which is about a third of the state. And the other uh, intern is going to be working, or not interns, their seasonal staff, is going to be working primarily on Lake Champlain, shoreland properties specifically. And then I will also be performing Lakewise assessments generally outside of the Lake Champlain Basin, um, though there'll be some overlap between me and the um, Inland Lakes Lakewise assistant. Hmm. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> But because we'll have two assistants rather than one last year, having one of them focusing on the Lake Champlain shoreline specifically um, isn't going to detract in any way from the amount of assessments we've been able to perform on inland lakes. So overall, we should be able to do more assessments next year with the addition of another staff person. Um, so that answers sort of the first two parts of that question. And then um, will we be establishing a program that designated individuals at each lake? Um, I would love to do this there, but as I said, there are 400 lakes in Vermont and that would just take an extraordinary amount of um, coordination. So I know that there are people at certain lakes who are the lake wise champions at those lakes. I know, um, like I said, Shannon Kelly uh, set up a lot of assessments at Iroquois. Peggy Barter at Seymour has done that, I think, for many years. Um, and Seymour, I think, has more lake wise awards than any uh, lake in the state. We've done a lot of assessments out there. So um, if you're interested in, in doing that at your lake, please get in touch with me. I can't do it for all 400 lakes, but if there's an interested person, I would love to work with them. Um, I'll also say uh, I, I've been working with someone at Great Averill Lake um, where there had never been a lake-wise assessment before, and we did probably 10 assessments out there last summer because she was really gung-ho about um, you know communicating with people and, and getting them to agree to assessments. So having a person on the ground in the community can be a huge, um, a huge help in promoting the program. Um, what can you tell us about the new evaluation software you're using? It's so it's a survey one two three application. It is the exact same um, questions as the paper assessment. It's just that it is um, done on a tablet or a phone, and it um, talks directly to a database that saves all of that information in one place. Um, automatically. Um, so if, if someone has a specific question about the evaluation software, you know, I'm happy to answer it, but there's really, I don't have much more technical, you know, specifications about it other than it's the same assessment. It's just done digitally. Um, what are other Vermont groups, conservation districts, et cetera, that perform lake shoreline evaluations similar to the DEC program? How do these programs differ? So um, the lake-wise assessments that are done by NRCDs that are Lakewise assessments are the same assessment that I'm doing. Um, I train those folks to do the assessment. Um, they're usually doing it maybe as part of a grant that they have. Uh, so that's the, the big difference for NRCDs would be that generally they are more confined by geography than um, DEC staff. So I know like last summer, um, one of the NRCDs had a grant to do Lakewise assessments at Joe's Pond. And if you were at a different lake and you asked her to do an assessment, she probably wouldn't have been able to do it because her funding was just for Joe's Pond. Whereas if you contact um, DEC, we travel throughout the state, um, basically anywhere we're asked to. Um, other groups doing uh, lake-wise assessments, I know that there are some nonprofits out there that have done lake-wise ass lake assessments, like Friends of the Winooski River was doing lake-wise assessments last summer. Again, it's the same exact assessment. It's the same questions. It's the same award. Um, other groups that may be performing shoreline assessments, I had to give this a little bit of thought because I can only think of like 
contractors or maybe someone doing the storm smart program or something like that um they wouldn't call it lake wise because it wouldn't be lake wise and it wouldn't result in an award um so they would pro probably be looking at you know storm water issues on the property suggesting probably some of the same best management practices but it's kind of coming from a different um place and it isn't a part of a bigger uh program and so again if there's other questions about that um that's that's my blanket answer here but if someone is saying it's lake wise it's all the same program um do I know of any potential funding sources for doing lake-wise assessments and performing other protective shoreline work, particularly in public areas? Yes, I do. Um, and that probably could be its own half hour presentation. Um, the answer to this question is that there's funding through the Clean Water um, Fund for projects in Vermont. There's a lot more funding for projects than there are for assessments. Um, and there's also the Lake Champlain Basin Program, but the the answer to the question is going to be different depending on where you are located. And so if someone has a specific question about a specific lake and where they might be able to find funding, I'm happy to answer that now or like, please get in touch with me. I do really want to be a resource for, you know, folks to ask questions and find answers. And I like to connect people, you know, with groups working in their area or with funding sources that are available, but it is so variable throughout the state that it's really difficult to briefly answer this question, except that there is funding out there um, and I can help you find it. So um, I think that was the last question it is. So thank you um, for having me here today. I am happy to answer any of the questions that came out in the chat. And like I said, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, email is best, especially in the spring, summer and fall. I'm rarely you know uh, available on my phone during the field season um, without it being scheduled so please send me an email and if you want to talk we can schedule a time to talk um, i'm really excited to be a part of this program and i'm looking forward to another really great field season with all of you so thank you well thanks allison that that was terrific you really covered uh, the waterfront as they say um i wondered if you could put your uh, contact information maybe in the in the chat box while Martha uh, looks and uh, begins to ask you some questions because I think people would like to get in touch with you for many of the reasons that you outlined so thank you so much so Martha um, could you help us with the uh, the chat and uh, sure hi Alice. some of the questions we have and by the way if, if, if people would like to raise their hand uh, in addition to the chat you know, we'll certainly do that as well. So don't be bashful. We've got plenty of time, but let's get started. Okay. Hi, Allison. This is Martha Winston, and I'm going to read you um, the some of the chats. Some I think you've answered. So if I so if I skip something, um, it may be because I think you've already given a good answer. Uh, the first one's from Tracy, and she says, "When you were referring to the parcel viewer e early in your talk." She was not sure what what that was. Can you slowly tell us about um, the initials for the parcel viewer? Yep, um, it is VCGI. It's the Vermont Center for Geographic Information. I'm going to put a link in the chat so that you uh, have that. Okay. And um, it is really easy. It just throws up a map of Vermont um, with all the different tax parcels. Thank you. All right. And then um, there was a question about how can we watch this um, meeting and see your good slides again, and it will be posted on the Federation of Vermont Lakes and Ponds website in a day or two um, and on the YouTube channel. So if anybody wants to watch it again, that's where it will be. Um, and Elizabeth asked about funding, limited budgets for landscaping, it's expensive. She should get in touch with you for funding if she has specific restoration projects that she wants to do. Um, yeah, I would say, you know, have a Lakewise assessment done if you haven't. Um, and then specific recommendations for your property can be made. Um, like I said, a NOMO area is the cheapest, like most inexpensive way to rewild and vegetate. Um, but there are also... Um, you know, lots of NRCDs have plant sales. Um, there are 
different way. I mean, you know, if you have a, a friend who has a perennial garden, there's ways to um, divide plants. Like uh, there's, there's lots of different <laughs> options. And then there is funding available. It, the funding does, it's more difficult to get funding for smaller projects, basically. Um, you know, they want to prioritize the heavy hitters, um, but it is possible. I know that <clears throat> on two different lakes, um, and our CDs were working with landowners to do likewise assessments, and then they batched together like seven um, landscaping projects into a project that would actually like have some teeth. So um, it is possible to do. And yeah, did you get in touch with me? And if you've had a, <clears throat> even if you've had a likewise assessment, um, you can still get back in touch with me and, and we can talk about your specific property. So along those lines, Allison, <clears throat> um, what about lake associations? Could they be the one that, uh, brings these several individuals together, private property owners to do it, just what you're suggesting. Is that a good way to do this? And is this something that uh, has happened before with lake associations you're aware of? Um, so I think if the lake association is a nonprofit um, and has like a nonprofit status, they would be eligible to apply for some of this funding. And, and again, the funding sources are different depending on where you are. Right. So I can't give you like a blanket answer. I will say um, the Lake St. Catherine Association working with um, the Pulteney Meadowy NRCD did get a bunch of funding from the Lake Champlain Basin Program to perform um, lake-wise assessments and do some implementations. So I have seen it happen before. Um, but again, you know, they're in a, a different part of the state. The Lake Champlain Basin program is only for lakes in the Lake Champlain Basin. So it is variable, but it's possible. Thank you. Um, and this one's from me. Um, we've had a couple new parcels developed on our pond and with disappointing results. <laughs> So I want to know, are you doing any kind of outreach for new shoreline development or new owners? Uh, do they have to come to you? Because, um, you know, once things are cleared and uh, things have gone wrong, um, it's hard to put them right again. And we know that enforcement is not um, particularly great in Vermont. <laughs> So pe people do a lot of things they shouldn't do to their shoreland. And if we could avoid doing it right up front, do you do any outreach? So no, um, the way that it works is that if anyone is doing new development, they're subject to the Shoreland Protection Act and they need to apply for permits. And so all of that sort of goes through the permitting um, department, which I'm not a part of, I'm a non-regulatory okay. uh, employee. So, it is unfortunate when people do things that they're not supposed to do, or they didn't get a permit, or they didn't follow their permit. Um, but the permitting program for new development is really supposed to um, be the first step for those um, homeowners in sort of figuring out what they should do. And and uh, the Shoreline Protection Act is fairly stringent about. Um, new development and uh, vegetation and setbacks and all of that stuff. Um, <clears throat> when it comes to <clears throat> properties that are <clears throat> already developed and how they manage their current property, that's sort of where um, the Lakewise program comes in is with um, current existing development and how to increase it to be better. Um, so I don't do, I mean, I do outreach <clears throat> to everyone and, but I don't specifically reach out to like people who have applied for new building permits or anything like that. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. I just find that um, even though people say they're following the new Shoreland Act, um, usually they're not in my, in my, in my experience. Some are very careful and others just aren't. So it's disappointing because like I said, once things are torn out and taken down, um, it takes a long time for those things to come back, the trees and shrubs and things. So, yeah. okay. Um, and that is my my um, concern as well. It's just that uh, that's not my area of expertise really. And I'm not an enforcement, I'm not regulatory at all. So I can't, I have no teeth to make anyone do anything. All right. Um, 
Okay, uh, there was a question about, um, from Jennifer Andrews. She says she's happy to hear that you have more help um, and that you're gonna be focusing on Lake Champlain watershed and Lake Champlain. Who might be designated and how do lakes out of the Champlain watershed, like in the Memphremagog watershed, get assistance? So if you're not in those designated um, high interest areas, how do we um, get assessments or get assistance? Right, uh, so maybe I didn't do a great job of explaining this. I work statewide and I can go anywhere in the state to do an assessment. Um, so there's not gonna be any like uh, pullback or restriction about um, being outside of the Lake Champlain watershed or not on Lake Champlain. It's my two seasonal assistants. Um, we'll be doing more work within the Champlain Basin um, but we'll still be able to also work outside of it. So, I mean, the best way is still just get in touch with me, um, set up an assessment. This is a great time of year to start thinking about that and start doing that. Um, and yeah, that's it's it's still the same um, system as it has been. Okay, so any lake that is asking, can we get help this summer? You would just say, reach out and try to get on your schedule. Yep. Okay. Okay, perfect. Um, will there be discounted plants available this year? Um, that's from Cheryl. Is there a time you do that or is that, is that something re that you just watch for regionally? Um, I would watch for that regionally. Like I said, some of the conservation districts do plant sales. Um, and that's probably the, I, I'm not sure. I, I have no knowledge of discounted plant sales that have been done through the LakeWise program. I think there may have been a partnership at one time um, a while back, you know, before I was here. And um, there's no there's no plan for me to be doing any discounted plant sales this year. But I do know that there are different groups that do them. So I would um, keep an eye on whatever group is in your region to see if they're going to do a plant sale. OK. They did buffers for blueberries or blueberries yeah. for buffers or something several years ago. Um, and you could get blueberry bushes, I remember that. Okay. Um, this is from Anne and she says, why can't the clean water funding be used for our greeter programs? Whoa, that's not a question for you, I don't think. It is not a question for me. <laughs> I, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> Okay, that well, we just had a greeter meeting earlier this morning. Maybe that's left over from that. Yeah, I would say uh, ask him. <laughs> she probably knows better than I do. Natalie says, what is NRCD? Right, those are the conservation districts. So it's the Natural Resource Conservation District. Um, they're throughout the state. So wherever you are, you have one. Um, so, you know, um, for example, uh, there's like the Orleans County NRCD that covers most of Orleans and parts of other counties, um, Caledonia County. They're not always county based though. Like there's a, like a Winooski NRCD that covers like a, there's a map on the website, on their website. Um, but they do lots of different things. And one of the things that they do is um, lake work or stormwater work. Um, and they, are great at finding funding. Um, so if you have a project that you think needs some clean water funding, you can, I would actually, I would suggest you get in touch with me first still and let me put you in touch with the NRCD. Um, but they do a lot of work like that. They do a lot of implementation work. Um, and it's, it's variable depending on where you live. Okay. Um, I know we had good luck with ours in Caledonia County. She's been very good, um, Emily. Uh, Finnegan. All right. It says, are there counties or local municipalities in Vermont with conservation staff who could also conduct the assessments? This is from Eric. So um, yes. Well, so there are the, the NRCDs that I was just talking about um, that can do assessments. Uh, but like I said, they're often constrained by sort of grant funding. Um, so for example, they might have, you know, funds to work on one lake, but not another, or they might be doing a lake watershed action plan on one lake, um, but not another. And that's just because they've been, they work on a grant basis where that's, you know, that's the only way that they get paid for their work. 
Um, there are, I think I mentioned like Friends of the Winooski River, that's a nonprofit that was doing assessments. Um, probably also they were tied by geography, but I don't think it was to a specific lake, it was a specific area. Um, and I'm trying to think if there's any other, I don't think that a lot of like towns or municipalities have that kind of capacity or staff. Um, so I would say, you know, if there's not um, a group that's already working on your lake, uh, that the best bet is probably to just get in touch with me and um, get an assessment that way. Okay. Um, and there's a few comments uh, about the permit process. Peggy says, it sometimes works to ask the permit specialist person for your area to learn whether the owner has a permit. Um, if not, the permit specialist will follow up. So that would be my, my original question about new development. Um, and then Beth says, in relation to people getting shoreland permits, the town of Morgan, there's a checkbox on the zoning permit. If the project is within 250 feet of the lake, the applicant is advised to get a jurisdictional de determination or a permit. Um, so again, that would be new, new uh, shoreline projects, I assume. Um, and then Cheryl says, will the VYCC be providing free labor to assist with lake-wise projects for the individual property owners this summer? So I believe that the grant that they have goes for another year, uh, but I, this is not really a question for me. Um, I think so, but um, I can't be 100% sure what their funding situation is like. Is that the uh, Youth Conservation Corps? Yes. Thank you. Um, and Natalie has a question. It's, she says, what is the difference between and our CDs and a regional planning commission. So my understanding of this is that like the NRCDs are working with individual landowners to do projects that improve their properties. And like, this isn't just like stuff. Um, a lot of them work with farmers and agriculture um, very heavily. And uh, regional planning commissions, I, I think they do more of like a, high oversight of like whole areas and sort of planning. Um, I am not an expert <laughs> in what regional planning commissions do, um, but that has been uh, my experience is that um, they just do, they they do different levels of uh, on the ground work. Well, that's um, everything in the chat box. Um, Allison, and I don't see any hands raised. Yeah, if anyone wants to ask a question, I saw one that uh, Gloria, I don't know if she's still here from Rescue Lake, had a question about funding, but I wasn't sure, Gloria, exactly what it was. Could you could you unmute yourself and ask your question? There, I think that what Allison said is that there is, we should reach out to her for funding in our specific areas. So. It's really, you know, there's three of us on, from the Lake Rescue Board on this call. We see that there's an opportunity. We're going to reach out to you and, and have you assess some property, spend the day with us. But for the people who aren't really where they need to be, what funding is available out there for people specific to our area? And I know it's it's a big call, but uh, it, it, is that something you could email me maybe later offline? Um, yeah, why don't we uh, discuss yeah, via email? Okay. I think, um, yeah, it's it's a lot easier to talk about when I know the specifics of, you know, location and, and what level of work we're talking about. So yeah, anyone who has a, a question like that about funding for a specific project or at a specific lake or is looking for a partner or um, anything like that, it's just easier to uh, talk one-on-one -on -one and, and hear all the specifics so I can give you a good recommendation. Right. So we'll reach out to you separately. Thank you. So are, are there other questions that people have? If not, I want to thank Allison and Al ask Allison if you have any last minute parting words. I mean, you're the go to gal on this. We're so grateful to you today. And it's such a, an opportunity for us to meet with you with people who have known about the program and now we're meeting you. And I think you're off to a great start. Anything you want to say in con conclusion today? Um, 
yeah, just thank you so much for having me. I hope that, you know, anyone who's here who hasn't had a likewise assessment is going to do it. Um, and uh, just that I'm really looking forward to the next field season and kind of hitting the ground running a little more organized than last year when I started first week of June. Um, so I'm ready and I hope all of you are too, and I'm looking forward to it. Well, you're off to a flying start. Thanks so much. Thank I you. wonder if Pat, Pat Swazi has uh, some comments she'd like to offer. I'll just, before I say some thank yous, um, I just want to give a shout out to No Mo. <laughs> um, <laughs> we did that a number of years ago, I have to say. That's like the best thing to do. Just stop mowing. Um, we just mow a path down to the water and um, you'd be amazed what happens. It's, it's fascinating to watch. Um, so... The easiest thing to do is to stop mowing. Um, um, and I'll say one other thing. Our Lake Association sponsored over several different seasons garden tours of properties that had won the LakeWise Award to encourage more people um, to come. And then we actually had um, someone who um, could sell some plants at the end. And we had some wine and cheese and talk at, you know, sort of the last, but we kind of did a progressive move from property to property. So that's another way to um, Lake Association could, um, you know, get some ideas. And I'm happy if someone wants to contact me, I'm happy to talk more about how we kind of set that up. Anyway, there's other ideas. I'm sure maybe that's, Jack, maybe that's a follow-up to this is to um, do another mini, mini seminar on ideas that Lake Associations have done. I know Peggy Barter, um, has done a huge amount of work at Seymour and um, probably has a million ideas that would be helpful. Anyway, I want to say, Allison, this was fabulous. Um, you know, great slideshow, great information. Thank you so much. Um, I want to thank, again, I want to thank um, Jack and the AIS Water Quality Committee and Jackie and the Follow Up Events Committee um, for putting this together and keeping us all on track. Um, I appreciate this. This is such an important thing. If we can really move from being the worst in the, in the country for shoreline dis disturbance, that's terrible. Um, so I hope that we're moving, you know, we, we can get all our lake, lakefront properties moving in the right direction. So um, thank you all. Um, and with that, I will close this meeting. And we will have a recording on our website um, in a couple of days. It takes me a couple of days to get it uploaded. Thank you again. Um, have a good day, everybody.